Our next speaker is Arnold August, and I should say that Arnold August is the sort of motivating spirit behind this panel. He's the one who said, let's have one, and, and, and really did all the work of putting together. And most of you will probably know Arnold August as a Montreal-based author and journalist uh, who has written three uh, very important books on Cuba, Democracy in Cuba in the 1997-98 elections, Cuba and its neighboring democracy in motion, sorry, Cuba and its neighbor's democracy in motion, um, and Cuba-US uh, relations. And his books have been praised as, as exceedingly accurate and accounts and very forceful accounts of, um, uh, of the US-Cuba relations and what's going on in Cuba. Um, He's, his and his works have been published in English, Spanish, fr and French in North America, South America, Europe, and the Middle East. So Arnold, please take the floor. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I am speaking from Montreal in the, on the uh, grounds of Canyon Queja Nation. Uh, I'll be focusing uh, directly on social media. A part of my uh, presentation today, 14 minute presentation today, is based on an expert analysis analyst in Spain whose name is um, uh, Macias Tovar, Julian Macias Tovar from Spain, quoting from the original Spanish. He says, the operation made intensive use of bots and new accounts recently created for the occasion and tending to make a chorus for SOS Cuba. But what is a bot? A bot is a software application that runs automated scripts over the internet. Typically, ta bot tasks are simple and repetitive, much faster than a person could tweet. New accounts, get this, more than 1,500 of the accounts that participated in the operation with the hashtag SOS Cuba was created between July 10th and 11th. Now, the first account that used the hashtag SOS Cuba was located in Spain. It posted more than a thousand tweets on July 10th and 11th with automation of five tweets, not per minute, five tweets per second. Tovar from Spain analyzed the more than 2 million tweets using the hashtag SOS Cuba that started asking for humanitarian aid given increasing COVID deaths in Cuba with the participation of artists and thousands of newly created accounts and bots produce, this produced mobilization in the streets. Tovar points out that the campaign were carry out specifically geared to artists to participate with the, the hashtag tweet SOS Cuba. Now, the recent question of artists is important in Cuba. Recent history, the San Isidro movement of so-called artists started to take place last year during the Trump administration. Their slogans were quite simple, pro-Trump financed by the U.S. with logistic, logistical support of the American embassy in Havana. Their slogans are very complicated. Vote Trump and vote Cuba. Now, this orientation by the artists last year, did this stop Biden? No. On March 12, 2021, under Biden, Julie Chung, as Assistant Secretary of State, recently met with the San Isidro movement activists. She, she said, quoting, quoting, we enjoyed an open exchange of views on free expression, assembly, media, and culture. We heard about the San Isidro movement. Thank you. We salute Cuba's brave champions of democracy and human rights, end of the quote. Now, the first demonstration in San Antonio de los Baños was publicized, not in Cuba. The first one was published in the United States by the account of one person named Yusnabi with thousands of retweets. As Tover, the Spanish analyst mentions, curiously, Yusnabi, Yusnabi, by the way, is a Latin American pronunciation as U.S. Navy. So he uses really the U.S. Navy hashtag disguised as something Latino. Is that Tover says this account comes out by far the most in his threads because 
it is one of the patterns of automated fake accounts that sp spread hoaxes and hate campaigns. So I was curious, this guy uh, used Bani. I investig investigated him on my own a couple of days ago. Here it is. His real name is Eduardo Yusnabi Perez, born in Cuba, but of course he went to the United States. Soon as he arrived in the United States, he got a paid job as a journalist with Cubanet, which is a dissident, dissident uh, outlet financed by the CIA's National Endowment for Democracy. And he also landed a job with Univision, based in the US. The main, uh, the main uh, focus there is to disinform people all across Latin America in, in Spanish. Now, so far we have seen United States, Spain, how they are involved. Also from Argentina. Now, this is important. The Argentina, uh, this is uh, Tovar explaining this. The Argentinian uh, Agustin Antonetti, this person, he is part of the right wing Fundacion Libertad. Antonet, Antonetti has been an active participant in the campaigns of hoaxes and bots and social networks against left-wing governments in Latin America, among them against President Evo Morales and Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And of course, yesterday he did not miss the occasion by attacking Lopez Obrador for his position in defense of Cuba. Now, in the, his account profile of this Argentine activist is emblazoned SOS Cuba. So we have, United States, Spain, and Argentina, together resulting on July 11th, the protests that broke out with hundreds of thousands of tweets and the partition, particip participation of many artist accounts. The hashtag became a global trend in several countries. That is why the presentation by Keith is important. He shows how the international media took the uh, trend topic that is restrained mainly to to Twitter account, they converted that into international media, television, mainstream media all across the world. They made it visible to millions of people across the world, whether they had a Twitter account or not. Now, there's an important issue people are discussing. Well, who participated aside from the core hashtag SOS Cuba in, in, in Cuba. Yesterday, I spoke by telephone with uh, a colleague of mine who was a journalist involved in analyzing social media. He is a real expert. Here's, here's the latest figures. Internet on the island, smartphones, 54.3% of, of people uh, having smartphones have access to the internet. Social media, 55.5% participate in social media such as Twitter and, uh, and Facebook. So you see that there is that whole uh, that situation there. And I, I also asked my colleague yesterday uh, on internet, sort of playing the devil's advocate. I asked, well, do you think that this is the expansion of internet is a double-edged sword? Well, he answered the following way. He knew exactly what I, what I was getting at. He said, it can, I quote, it can be said that although internet access has increased, this is very positive, it also has a negative effect of providing for the counter-revolution access to the population, especially to the young people. He is referring to a section of the youth only, only a section. This uh, coincides with my own experience. In 2018, 2019, they gave a series of lectures to university students in Havana and other cities in, in, in Cuba. It was really uh, very encouraging to see these youth so clear on the issue of imperialism, making no distinction between Obama and Biden or Bush before in the sense that all American presidents have this basic goal of subverting the Cuban revolutions as, previ uh, as uh, previous speakers have mentioned. And they we even discussed very touching topics, such as, is there such a thing as uh, of, uh, in the Cuban culture of being naive about uh, certain uh, individuals such as Obama? It was really 
inspiring to see how these people have no uh, illusions at all about the United States. But I was still struggling with this last night, how to present it, this to you today, because it is a complicated situation. So I found a, 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 a perspective direct from Cuba in the Cuba, de, Cuba Debati website, which is not officially a Cuban uh, outlet, but of course it supports the revolution. This article last night, which impressed me so much, was written by uh, Fabian Escalante. He's well known. I'm sure Claude and others know about him. He's a major general, a former head of the Cuban intelligence services. He is the author of several books on the US intelligence service activities against Cuba and has investigated the assassination of John F. Kennedy from the Cuban prison. So his views are important. Allow me to share with you certain aspects roughly translated from Spanish. Undoubtedly, he says, the social explosion, notice he uses the word social explosion, and much of the mainstream Cuban media, they do not use the word social explosion. Undoubtedly, the social explosion that occurred in our country on July 11 of this year su surprised us all and not for lack of evidence and indications. Today's Cuba, he went on to say, and the world is different from yesterday's and even more different from that of the first years of the revolution. The reasons that make it impossible to use the same methods of analysis of crisis management used before. There is a young, he said, a young depoliticized sector of the population due to our inefficient political and patriotic, patriotic work that does not understand the need for resistance to imperial policy and wants to just want to improve their living, living condition, but does not find an immediate solution to their expectations. So he, is, he continues to write, the days have passed since the events reported, and as it happens, many interpretations come to the fore, this is true. While the media campaigns in the United States and its allies continue to blatantly accuse Cuba of human rights violations and other uh, atrocities with the open intention to create the condition for a U.S. military invention. He should know about U.S. military inventions. We revolutionists, he said, have to meditate and gather experiences about the events that have taken place. He's being very realistic. The United States and its fascist government are the main responsible, but, and this is important, we also have responsibility, we the Cubans, for the mistakes made, which require a self-critical analysis, not only marginal references. It is necessary, he said, to delve into why mistakes took place. For example, the influence amongst the youth, what were its causes and how we are going to solve them. Now, reading uh, Escalante, what he said about youth, one thing came to mind, uh, is that I, I did a lot of work, I wrote a lot, I have these in my books, the 2016 uh, Obama offensive uh, when he came to Cuba uh, in 2016. With Obama came a whole slat, a whole series of, uh, of individuals, for example, Rolling Stones, Rihanna, parts of Havana occupied by the filming of Fast and Furious, even the Channel Vision fashion show also occupied part of Havana. So we see even on the Cuban press and all that, uh, Cuban youth running after these events. And I think in my view, these events instilling in the minds of the Cuban youth, individualism and consumerism, and certainly not helping the, the, the cause of pride in Cuba's sovereignty and its own system social system. So in conclusion, I really have only one short conclusion. That is, the, what was organized in July 11th was from abroad. The, the core organizing organization was from abroad. It was not a spontaneous domestic uh, uh, activity. I was proud to have contributed in a very minor way to an article uh, called The Bay of Tweets, written by Aaron Alan McLeod of Mint Press. Bay of Tweets 
is, is pretty good. I mean, I think uh, 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 it was uh, the first speaker, Wendy, mentioned the Bay of Pigs. Well, as far as I'm concerned and others, that offensive by the social media leading up to July 11th was sort of another Bay of Tweets uh, um, uh, invasion. Now, every, as far as I'm concerned, everything else is still up in the air. Who participated aside from the SOS Cuba agitators? Was it massive? Was it completely negligible? I would say neither. The situation is still unfolding. For example, just yesterday, I quoted that article from Escalante. There, will, there have been other similar ones before, and there will be more in the coming days and weeks. It is not just an issue of numbers. I spoke to another friend of mine in Havana very late last night. I was putting finishing touches to this presentation, and he had a view which is different than Escalante. He said, regarding those people who participated uh, along with the SOS Corps, SOS Cuba uh, Corps was, and he quoted, disparity. Those who were in the, those demonstrations, because no matter how much one is upset with things, we cannot do anything that hands over the country to the Yankees on a silver platter. End of quote from my friend late last night. So Cuba, this thing in Cuba is still going on. The way I see it, Cuba, like Venezuela, is still an ongoing struggle. For example, just last Saturday, Trudeau's government by its uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mark Garneau, uh, issued a statement against, I think this was mentioned by others as well, a crackdown in, uh, in, in Cuba. Now, if you Google the word crackdown, two words, Google and crackdowns in Cuba, you will see how many times it shows up. So Trudeau and his government are contributing to the overall narrative against Cuba uh, under the uh, cover of uh, crackdowns and repression and all that. Now, Trudeau, so he seems to be in an indirect manner providing support for the so-called protest against the government. Now, Trudeau has a history. How many people know when he visited Cuba in November 14, 2016, he met with dissidents. These dissidents he met then in July 11, directly or indirectly support the protesters against the government. So in finishing, allow me to say, Trudeau should rather change course and take into account a petition deposited in the Canadian parliament, asking him to call on Biden to uh, lift the blockade. Sign that. And another positive note, last night, my friend also said, I think Putin slapped Biden in the face with the dispatch of two planes loaded with aid by express order of Putin. Thank you very much.